Okay, so I'm sitting down with Ron Kubik. Ron, can you tell me what unit you were with in Vietnam and what years? Yes, sir, I was in E Company, 1st 501st Battalion. Um, in 1967, 1968. Okay, and at some point you met a gentleman there named Richard Flaherty? I did. Okay, how'd you first meet him? He was a lieutenant. Well, I was with, uh, when I was in, in Nam, part of the time I was in a mortar platoon that stayed at base camp, and then I went with recon unit, and uh, so we were in the field. But both in base camp and in the field, we had opportunity to encounter uh, the company that, that Richard was part of, which I believe was, was C Company. And so, in doing that, a lot of times, you know, the men just kind of mingled and they got to know each other. And, and uh, there were a couple other guys I knew there from, from his company. And I saw him, you know, in both in base camp and in, in the field. So it was a little strange to see a guy that small? It was very strange. When I first looked at him, I did a double take. You know, and then I realized he was a lot, an officer. And uh, so that really, had my curiosity up. So I started asking, who is that guy, you know? And uh, so I was told that he was platoon leader, and, and uh, well, you know, the guy I was talking with, he said, and he's a pretty good one. So and as I saw him interact with the men, uh, there wasn't any doubt that he was in charge. But yet, uh, you know, the men didn't really fear him but I saw the respect that was there too, because they knew that he, he, you know, he, he could be um, stringent at times, but uh, also the men knew he cared about them, and that he wasn't going to ask them to do anything he wouldn't do. So there was a there was a respect there for Mr. Flaherty. When you say stringent, uh, can you give me some examples what stringent would be? Well, just. Uh, you know, he, he would tell somebody to, you know, you know, to straighten up or quit fooling around, um, quit, quit, quit to grab acid, um, and they did. When he, he spoke, I mean, they did. Um, a lot of times he would interact with the uh, uh, sergeants there, and so, and that was, you could see that there was a good working relationship there too. Did you ever go out on a, a mission with him or? No, not on a mission with him, but we were uh, connected with Charlie Company a couple times. And so I saw him out in the field too. Can you tell me about some of those times? Any of them come to, to mind? I never saw him actually in combat, but the, the times I saw him out there is when when like they were taking a rest and we were nearby and there was some interaction between the between the troops and uh, so but he was pretty much uh, just like everyone else out there but he was ready to go and just a little bit of an interaction I had with him like I one day you know he just he spoke and said hey you know where are you from who are you with and uh, it wasn't uh, in a bad way, but he's just um, wanting to know who I was and where, what, what unit I was with and what quit group because he hadn't really seen me before, I guess. And uh, so I just told him I was with, with recon. And uh, so we were kind of side by side there. And, and uh, so I just asked him how things are going. He said, they're going good. And uh, so just little things like that. But he was, a per he was personable mm -hmm. and uh, and, in, in, you know, for a little guy, he had a big voice. And, you know, his, his, his voice carried. You know, that it, maybe it was something he had practiced, but, uh, but it worked. You know, and when he spoke, the men paid attention. So. Did you know any guys who didn't get along with him? I didn't. Or uh, had uh, problems with him? I didn't, yeah. no. The guys I, I spoke with, you know, just, they, they had a respect for him, said he was a pretty good guy. 
Did you lose touch with Richard after the war? Did you keep in contact? I never saw him after the war. I got, it was a long time before I even talked to anyone I was with. Um, when I got wounded, I was medevaced out of there and came home on a, on a litter. I was on a litter when I got back to the States. So, no, I never saw him after that. What, what, what would you think about um, the fact that here's a guy you saw him out in the field, he was pretty proficient, seemed like he had his, his things together, was in charge of all these men's lives, to find out he became homeless? That was a shock to me when I found that out. I found that out uh, probably last year, that he was uh, just living on the streets. So yeah, I was shocked. I would never expect it out of him, because it re really seemed to have his his life in order. It seemed to be in charge. He knew it. When seeing him interact with other people and the way he talked to me, it seemed like he had a really good idea of who he was, and his thoughts about himself were were good. And I wouldn't have expected him to become a homeless type of person. And so the only thing I could think of is that. He chose to be. Yeah, yeah. He, he uh, at the end, he, uh, he was really fighting a lot with the VA hospitals. I don't know if you've had any interaction with uh, some of your injuries or ever trying to get assistance from them, or whether it was good or bad. With the VA hospital, I've been treated very, very well up until I moved to North Carolina. And so I'm in, in the <coughs> part of the VA system that works out of Fayetteville near Fort Bragg, and things move very, very slowly there. And trying to get an appointment is very difficult. I've never had this dif difficulty at any other of the VAs. Um, I, have, I started out with a VA in Erie, Pennsylvania, and then Pittsburgh, and Baltimore, uh, not Baltimore, but B Buffalo, New York. I was in Albany, New York. Syracuse, New York, Columbia, Missouri, and I never had a difficulty until I moved to uh, North Carolina. And down there, things grind so slowly, it's almost like they're moving backward. Does it almost feel like after you serve your country and you're just trying to get the medical help that you were promised, does it almost feel a little bit of a betrayal? Could that have been part of Richard's anger at the end? I'm sure it was a part of all of our anger. We, when we were in in Nam, we had an enemy over there, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. That was our enemy. When we came home, we felt as if we were betrayed by our government and betrayed by the media and betrayed by the population, by our country. So, you know, if you want to know who, who I thought my enemy was when I came home, I would say, you're my enemy. People who stayed here, the civilians who stayed here. When I came home, I was subject to a lot of ridicule, verbal abuse. And I'm sure Richard was too. Other guys that I, that I served with in, in Nam came home to the same thing. Yeah, so those scars of coming home and, and receiving the type of treatment you guys did, um, you know, it must have been pretty shocking. I, I think now as a police officer, these aren't the greatest times to be a cop politically, but it's nothing compared to what you know, the reception you guys got when you came home. I think it's pretty similar now. Yeah. You, you know, you, you guys are, my hat's off, my hat's off to you. You know, I have a high reach, well, I've, of course, I was a police officer, and I did serve in that capacity. But, you know, the guys who are out there now, um, they're, they're like targets. And so I have a lot of respect for the police that are out there. Yeah. Well, I served under Rick Lencioni, and I was prou proud to serve under Rick. Um, Rick has, is the same kind of guy big heart, man of integrity, and uh, so it was a pleasure to, to serve with Rick and be, you know, have him as a leader. 
And uh, so it, it, I think it would have been the same thing with, with Flaherty. What, what type of bond do you get with a man you barely know, but you're in a situation where you, your lives rely on each other like that? What sort of bonds form with these guys that are here that you haven't seen in 40 years? And the bond is strong because here are some, here are some guys that in a combat situation, if they had to, they'd take a bullet for you. Or I would have taken a bullet for them. That's what we were there fighting for. It wasn't for honor and the flag so much as we were fighting for each other. But yeah, we, you know, there was part of that too. You know, we were there, we re respected and honored our country. We took an oath. You know, we had the hearts of a patriot. And, but yeah, we we're fighting for one another too. And I know that like Rick Lencioni, he would have taken a bullet for me. And so would Flaherty. Just, and that's the kind of guys, we, you know, we, that's the kind of guys we were. I don't know, I don't remember any slackers over in Nam. Everybody pulled their own weight. Yes, and we had to. Um, but what would you say about their situation? What, what would you, what's your feeling on it that these guys that serve so proudly with you are now living on the streets? Well, that's kind of a tough question, but uh, I can only speak for myself. There's a part of me that just likes to get out of society for a while. Likes to get out of, out of touch. Um, I used to drive my wife crazy during the first few years after, <laughs> after I came back from uh, We had a place, we had a house in the country. And it was woods all around us. And I'd walk outside like on a Saturday afternoon and without even thinking about it, just without any plan to do so, I would just go for a walk in the woods and uh, maybe along some streams or just go and come back the next day without planning to do it. I just go out and do so. <laughs> she gets so upset with me. But uh, it was just, um, yeah, I wanted to just to get out. And that's one thing I liked about being in Nam, you know, in the times we spent in the, in the jungles, and uh, I liked it. I've always been, even as a young man, before, you know, as a kid, I liked being out in the woods and along the streams and so on. But that's one thing I liked about o over there, I just like being out. And so after coming home, I don't know, there were times that just wanted to walk away from everything. Of course, I didn't because I had a wife and children. I couldn't walk away from responsibilities. But if I didn't have a wife and children, maybe I would have. Maybe be on the, next to that tree next to Richard. Maybe, yeah. yeah. If you didn't have the wife and kid, um, and he, like Rick said, Rick also told me, needed that isolation sometimes. And Rick told me he goes off in the woods and if he didn't have those kids, maybe he wouldn't come back. There's something about you guys that finds the peace by being alone and out there, and maybe that's what Richard was looking for, his peace. When, and that could be too. Um, going out in the woods, and I still like to do that. Uh, there's that peace there also, but a sense of being hyper-vigilant also is there, like watching everything around, moving slowly, listening to every sound. When I went to Fort Benning, went down to the uh, Army Museum down there, and they have periods of, of history. Different sections uh, are from various times of our military back to the Revolutionary War. War of 1812, uh, war with, with uh, 
in Texas that were in Mexico in the Civil War. You know, they have, and th so they've got one room down there that is the Vietnam room. And so I was with my youngest son going through this museum, and when we went into the Vietnam room, it was all the, all the decor, everything in there looked just like being in the jungles in Nam. Um, it looked like you're walking on a little path like we saw over in Nam. And various sounds of the jungle were there. Um, and then different aspects of battle were going on, being played and all over the, the sound system in there. And so we were in there maybe five minutes and my son says, Dad, do you have any idea how much you've changed since we've walked into this room? He says, you're watching every step, you're looking at everything around you. When you talk to me, you're whispering. And I realized it was, it was true because all that from back then was still in here. It's, it is still in here now, still in here. And knowing how to, just having that within to, to respond in, in that way is in, inherent now. And I'm sure that it is, was that way with, with Richard. You told me once over the phone in a conversation that Richard almost belonged in Vietnam. That's, it seemed like that was his home. He was very comfortable out there. He seemed very comfortable. And, and there was also something within him that I, I think just a little bit of conversation I had with him that, you know, he, he looked for a fight. And uh, um, so I, I, just, I asked him one day, well, just in, in passing, hey, uh, you got, got any trouble lately? He said, no, but I'm looking for some, you know. And, <laughs> and so it was just, yeah, you know, it was, uh, that just seemed to be part of him. Yeah, he, he was looking for something. Yes. Well, have you find any today? No, nope, but I'm looking for something. That's him, yeah. yeah. He had no fear out there is what I was told. Right. Didn't seem to, yeah. he thrived on it. He thrived on it, but a lot of you guys thrived on that adrenaline. We did. Yeah. Well, and still do. Like I skydive and, and uh, I'm, I'm 68 years old. I've got 11 jumps so far this year. You know, I'll, I'll go out in my kayak out where the alligators are and the sharks out on the ocean or whatever. Just, you know, um, I don't know, it's, it's something in there that uh, just makes you feel more alive. Yeah, Rick told me he likes to walk the razor's edge it just makes them feel alive, yeah. yeah. Tell me the same thing. Or like that Corvette of mine, you know, having it go 120 or 130 mile an hour, you know, is, uh, I better not tell that to police officers. okay, that's all right. <laughs> right. But anyway, yeah, it's just. Uh, it gets you back to that feeling of uh, being alive, fully yes. being alive. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Rick also told me about a letdown when he came back in country, he said, it's just how weird if people are crossing the street doing the only activity, they're not looking for booby traps, they're not looking for shooters. He said, it just was so weird to walk across the street and not have to worry. Well, and that's true. You know, this, for me, the scariest thing I faced was coming home. That was scarier to me than being in Nam. And I was so surprised when I came back to my hometown to see that nothing had changed, that surprised me so much to see that everything was the way it was before. And that's because I had changed so much. But I was scared the first time I went out in public after I got back, I shook. I didn't have my buddies around me. I didn't have my M16, I had no grenades, I had nothing, I was vulnerable, vulnerable, defenseless, yes, and I shook, just scared the crap out of me, yeah. it took me a while, and I don't think I've ever really adapted to be living in society, I mean I get along all right.
would like that. I'd like to hear what he had to say. Because it just, um, I don't know, his, his personality, he was a character. And, and he had, a, it was almost like he had a different viewpoint on things that uh, anyone else I knew. You know, he was, and he was creative. And so, yeah, I would love to just sit down with him and just have, and, you know, kind of, you know, all this life that's, he was like bigger than life in such a little guy. And it was, that was, that was the comical part too. You know, there's just such a little guy, but there, there's so much intelligence and creative ability, creative thinking, spontaneity was all there in, in Flaherty. And I would love to just sit down with him now and just listen to him. I mean, it would be worth, I don't watch comedy shows anyway, but to me it would be, it would be very entertaining and beneficial and just, yeah. I think we got it all, Ron. Man, thank you so much. You're welcome, sir. Yeah, man, it was really a pleasure. Well, I hope it's beneficial to you. Ron Kuvik interview, take one. <laughs> this is like in the movies, you know? This is it, just like in the movies. That's what we're about. Keep the noise down. I'm trying to interview Mr. Kubik. Yeah, well, you, if you already know the answer to the questions, why bother asking? Right, well, well. Yeah, why are, we, why are we going through this routine? See, you have been on the other side of the table, too, I see. Yeah. <laughs> Doing now, it seems like they regret the treatment that they gave the, to the veterans of Vietnam. Excuse me, let me turn this off. That's Looney Tunes. Yeah, well, that's... Keep those cameras rolling on that one. That's, that's who it was. It was Looney Tunes. That there was, you go. That was, uh, yeah. 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 Anyway, that was uh, T Tom and Jerry Cole. There you go. I, when, I, when I came home, um, I came home on a litter. But after I got healed up, I wanted to re-enlist and go back to Nam. I wanted to go back and go back and go back. And they wouldn't let me re-enlist because of my injuries. They retired me. And I, I, was, I was devastated. You want me to go to what? Be a civilian? I don't know how to be a civilian. I'm not a civilian. You're a warrior. You, you, know, you changed me, yeah. I'm a savage now. Yeah. Warrior. Savage in heart. Still am. Yeah. Yeah, so don't piss me off. 